Good morning. It's always great to be with you. Uh, I hope that, you know, by uh, meeting with you and sharing a little bit from, uh, uh, from God's word and through my studies that I'm an encouragement to you. Let me know, let me uh, tell you that you're an encouragement to, Dean, to me. I know it's got to be difficult to have been going on this long without being able to gather with your fellow Christians, uh, to be able to sing together, to be in the same room together. Uh, certainly, uh, we had the benefit of doing that somewhat here in Georgia. You still can't hug and all those kinds of things, of course, but, uh, but we have a little bit more of, of the old life back. But you uh, inspire me that you have stayed true and that you're consistent and uh, committed to your God and to your church. If you are a parent, then you know that one of the most enjoyable times you spend or spent, if they're grown up, with your children is reading them stories. Many of us at least read books to them at bedtime. And most of us, probably as Christians, telling or reading Bible stories to them. And many of us has now come to see certain parts of the, bi parts of the Bible as more or less children's stories. The creation, Noah's Ark, Daniel in the lion's den, for examples. We associate the messages in those stories as somewhat being for children, as we likely learn them as children and are in turn teaching them to our children. We fall into the trap of classifying them as children's stories. Do you find that there are parts of the Bible that you somewhat dismiss as children's stories? Scriptures that are great for teaching in Bible school or VBS, but they're really unnecessary to be studied as adults. After all, all there is to learn in those stories could be and was learned in elementary school, right? Wrong. The Bible makes no such distinction and queer, clearly makes quite the opposite point. Paul wants us to know that everything we call scripture is there for our benefit. It serves a purpose, and we need to study it to get that benefit. First, in Romans 15, 4, Paul tells the church in Rome, for whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Since the New Testament was compiled, let alone written, when Paul wrote to the Romans, his use of the word scriptures clearly makes the point for the value of the Old Testament. That isn't to say that he isn't including the words that compose the New Testament, but it makes it clear that we can find patience and comfort in all the scriptures that might help us to not only bring us hope, but help to keep us focused and confident that such hope would be realized. Paul then turns to the young preacher, Timothy, in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, to explain that all scripture is through the inspiration of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Scripture is profitable for a number of purposes, and through it a true follower of God can be complete and able to do every good work that they set out to accomplish. That being true, I want to study one of those so-called children's stories and see if we cannot gain more from it than we did as a child today as well as to be reminded of those lessons that we did gain when we first studied. This morning, let's take a deeper look at the story of David and Goliath by looking at the participants, their preparation, and its purpose. We all know the primary participants in the story. There's David, the young, zealous, faithful, and confident young man. There's Goliath, the antagonist, the boastful and brash giant. And there's Saul, the fearful, the desperate, the king. First, let's start out by looking at David. I suspect many of you look at this story as the initial entry of David, both as a Bible character and as someone meeting Saul. But this is far from the facts. It is not the first time that David pops up in the Bible or in this book. He only appears in the chapter that precedes the story we're going to look at, but a lot has already happened in his life. First, we need to know that Saul has lost God's support, as shown in chapter 15. And God has, at that point, chosen his successor, as Samuel tells Saul in 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 28. So Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today 
and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. Clearly making a point that he knows who's going to be that next king, person who he says is better than Saul. So by the time of the battle with Goliath, we find that David has already been anointed to succeed Saul as king, though Saul is clearly unaware of it. Of course, even Samuel fell prey to looking at men as a man would versus how God views men. He thinks that one of David's older brothers, Elab, is the obvious selection based on his looks alone. So that when the procession of Jesse's son starts, Samuel says in 1 Samuel 16, verses 6 and 7. So it was when they came that he looked at Elab and said, surely the Lord's appointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or the height of his stature, because I have refused him. The Lord does not see as a man sees, for a man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. God reminds Samuel that God has the ability to look at a man's heart and not to be swayed by his outward appearance. Now, God's first choice for king catered somewhat to man's thinking when Saul was chosen. Samuel records what Saul looked like in 1 Samuel 9, 2. And he had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. There was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel. From his shoulders upward, he was taller than any of the people. Good looking and tall, just what people look for in their leadership. But even in that choice, God selected someone without the most ideal qualifications. As Saul himself pointed out to Samuel in 1 Samuel 9, verse 21. And Saul answered and said, Am I not a Benjaminite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel and my family, the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then do you uh, speak to me like this? After rejecting the seemingly obvious choice among Jesse's sons, God makes it clear to Samuel that his choice this time is David, the youngest, the one who serves as the family shepherd, as he explains in 1 Samuel, Samuel 16, verses 11 through 13. And Samuel said to Jesse, are all the young men here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, and there he is, keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was right, with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. All right. So David's been introduced as the king in waiting. But the situation with Goliath is the first time Saul has any occasion to meet him. Right? Wrong. Again, in chapter 16, following Samuel's leaving David, we find that Saul's spirit is distressed. Clearly, it's a result of God's rejection of him. And it's determined by those around him that Saul needs calming. So we continue to read in 1 Samuel chapter 16, starting with verse 14 and going through verse 18. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servants said to him, Surely a distressing spirit from God is troubling you. Let our master now command your servants, who are before you, to seek out a man who is a skillful player on the harp. And it shall be that he will play it with his hand when the distressing spirit from God is upon you, and you shall be well. So Saul said to his servants, provide me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. Then one of the servants answered and said, look, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a handsome person, and the Lord is with him. Saul's servants have identified a solution probably with the inclusion of God, or at least some form of comfort for Saul's distress. Let's find a skillful player of the harp to play for you. Saul agrees and immediately requires that they find such a man. Again, probably prompted by God, one of those servants responds that he knows just the man for the job, David. With that endorsement, Saul sends for him. And he performs that task, among others, for Saul. And Samuel reports in that same chapter, verse 23, and so it was, whenever the spirit from God was upon Saul, that David would take a harp and play with his hand. 
and Saul would become refreshed and well, and the distressing spirit would depart from him. But David's appearance on the battlefield, which leads to his meeting with Goliath, doesn't come from his side job of soothing the king. Instead, his three oldest brothers have gone with Saul into battle against the Philistine, while David is left, along with four older brothers, and he is splitting his time between being the family shepherd and his serving with Saul. But this time, his father sends him on an errand. He's to take food to his brother and cheese to their captain in order to see how they are and to bring back a sign of their health. It is an errand boy that he, where he becomes a participant in this story. When it comes time for David to face Goliath, he's been chosen in his next king. He's already well acquainted with Saul, but he's at the battlefield just to take a gift from his father and confirm the health of his three older, oldest brothers. That brings us to the second main character, Goliath. Of course, the primary thing we know about Goliath was that he was a giant. That makes the story intriguing versus him being just an average Philistine. Well, Samson killed a lot of those. This one's called out by Samuel in, verses, in chapter 17, verses 1 through 4. Now, the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and were gathered together at Sokoth, which belongs to Judah. They encamped between Sokoth and Azekah in the Ephesidim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley in between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath whose height was six cubits and a span. Now, prior to the flood, there were a group of giants. Giants later referred to Nephilim. They were mentioned by Moses in Genesis chapter six, verses one through four. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful. And they took wives from them for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Yet his days will be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men of who were of old, men of renown. Note that this says that there were giants that existed in those days, pre-flood, and as Moses was also after the flood. Now, your Bible, like what I read, likely says that Goliath was six cubits in a span, which we believe makes him about nine feet, nine inches tall. Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are based on an older manuscript than what was used for most of our modern versions, say that he's only four cubits in a span, which make him about six feet, nine inches tall. Not the size we would normally think of when we think of mythical giants. But either way, he was a giant to the average Jew of the time who was only about five feet, six inches tall. Goliath also came from a family of giants. He had four brothers who were all later killed by David's men in 2 Samuel chapter 21. Now, it was intimidating enough that he was a giant man and a Philistine to boot, but he was a boastful man, challenging all comers as he did with the Israelites for an extended period of time. We read in Again, chapter 17, verses 11 through 11, 8 through 11. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you came out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. While David was appalled by the audacity of Goliath's challenge when he heard it for just the first time when he went to visit his brothers, Goliath had made that challenge for a long period of time. Verse 7, 16 says, the Philistine drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. So 40 days, 80 times, he has presented the same message, and now we're on the 81st day. So we have the two combatants, 
but the battle would not have been waged without the participation, as well as the lack of participation of a third person, King Saul. We've already established that Saul was specifically chosen by God to serve as the first king of Israel. While he had the physical attributes that people would apply to a king, he was not a man of strong confidence, nor a man of patience. At the time of this story, we also know, and he knows, that God is taking the kingdom away from him. Whether it is that reality or an actual act of by God, he is frequently distressed. I think we see it also finds him doubting, for good reason, whether he can act with God's blessing. And he knows that Samuel won't come to his rescue, since Samuel has already said he will no longer come into his presence. Therefore, it shouldn't be surprising to us when we hear his reaction is matching that of his men. In that same chapter, in verse 11, we can read, when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So Saul, the great king, is dismayed and greatly afraid. Not what you want from your king, particularly on the battlefield as your leader. He knows that he needs a solution and has already decided he's not the answer. So apparently, as best we can tell, he spreads the word to attract a champion by offering a great bonus to that person. And we read there in verse 25 that it's reported to, to David when he asks about what happens to someone who kills him. So the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches. will give him his daughter and will give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Those are very attractive rewards. Great riches would be enough for me. Then to be married into the royal family and to have my father's estate, all his properties exempt from taxes, that's pretty high wages for taking him on, for killing Goliath. But at this point, after 40 days, no matter how long the message has been out at the bounty, it hasn't created any challengers, any takers. Because those listening to the boastful challenges from such an intimidating figure, well, it's created fear to the point where no one believes that they can oppose it. And that seems to make Paul a bit, or Saul rather, a bit desperate and willing to jump on any potential camp champion. So when he hears what David said in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 26, David spoke to the men who stood by him saying, what shall be done to the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this, who... For who should be down for the event? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? When he hears that that's what David said, Saul sends for David, a young man with whom he's quite familiar, as we mentioned before. And then in verse 31, we read, Now, when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported him to Saul and he sent for him. When David appears, Saul first dismisses David as being totally incapable of opposing Goliath. After all, he looks and he sees his harpists. But David explains not only his experience as shepherd in defending his sheep, but more importantly, he explains why he's been successful in fighting lions and bears. God delivered him then, and God will do so again with Goliath. And that's what he tells Saul in verses 32 through 37. Then David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, go, and the Lord be with you. So David 
attributes all his past successes and the promise of his future success, not to his great ability, not to his power, his strength, his weapons, but to God. And as he presents his case, Saul is now willing to entrust this critical assignment to a man who came into his service as a harp player. It is clear that he's taken the words of Samuel to heart, and he knows that God is no longer with him, but instead that he's focused on David. But David has been mentioned before as being favored by God. But Saul, Samuel has already told Saul in verses 26 and 29 of chapter 15, but Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned around to go away, Saul seized the edge of his robe and it tore. So Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor relent, for he is not a man that he should relent. The message is he's, he's turned from you, Saul, and that's not a decision that can be changed. He doesn't change it. He is our strength. And where he decides to go and where he takes us is where we're going to go. So Saul has to turn to another to solve the problem of Goliath. And he decides through the words that David shares with him that that will be his choice to be the champion. Thus, we have our participants, two of them willing, one unwilling. Let's consider then the preparation for the fight that awaits. We'll begin with looking at the true soldier in this fight, that giant Goliath. He not only is tall, but he's also well armored, and in a way that shows his superiority to others, extends well past his height. Sam records to us the extent of Goliath's battle armor in verses 5 through 7 of chapter 17 of 1 Samuel. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. The weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels, and a shield bearer went before him. Let's reflect a little bit about what scripture tells us about that armor. He had a helmet of brass with his body protected by the coat of mail. Not only did that mean that he had metal protecting his vital organs, but we're told that it weighed 5,000 shekels of brass. Which scholars, although disagreeing, generally interpret to be about 125 pounds. His protection extends to his legs, where he has brass arm. He's armed with a spear with a tip that weighs 600 shekels, or about 15 pounds. Now, it's one thing to carry around something that heavy, but it's a whole different thing to be able to accurately throw, or in the case of a spear, to jab with a long pole having an object of that weight at its end. He's proceeded into battle by his shield bearer, knowing he has a shield. We also know he had a sword in the sheath that he wore. And David also declares before the battle that Goliath is armed with a javelin in addition to the spear. Not only was the sheer size of the man intimidating, but his obvious strength to carry such heavy armor with weapons and still be able to maneuver in battle made that clear. And his ability to have weapons and his carrying of his body around was it clear that he had extensive preparation. He was well protected and well armed. It's also important to note that brass was not something that was readily available. It's not something everybody wore. But he was able to access it and pay for what was expensive to use it for his armor. And to have an armor that was so large of made all of brass was intimidating in a whole different way. And you can imagine that on a sunny day, it's likely that the armor shined and created a glare in the eyes of the Israelites, further intimidating. It's also likely that he was the Philistine champion, not just by his physical characteristics, but through battles and contests that approved his worth to be declared such. Think, think of a person who stands six, seven or taller. Now, not everyone who reaches that height can be a successful basketball player. I, I suspect that you know somebody like that. Size is one aspect, but skill is also required in ten. The same is true of becoming the Philistine champion. Size and skill. That's the men David, Saul, and the Israelites 
see across the battlefield taunting them on a daily basis. Now David enters. He certainly isn't outfitted in any way like Goliath. He's just come from the fields where he tended Jesse's flocks. He hasn't come to fight, and we have no record of him being a soldier at any point prior, nor does he even claim such. You may recall that Samuel tells us that he had become not only Saul's harpist, but also his armor bearer, though he's not been at the ready day after day in this engagement with the Philistines. After Saul agrees to let David take on Goliath, he attempts to outfit him to somewhat compare to his adversary by giving him his armor to placing it on David in chapter 17, verses 38 and 39. So Saul clothed David with his armor and he put a bronze helmet on his head and he also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these for I have not tested them. So David took them off. While Saul's servants had identified David as a mighty man of valor and a man of war, we don't know why, he was not the physical specimen that those words would normally invoke in the listener. He might have learned to be able to fight in that armor, but he had not spent time getting used to moving in them to the weight, to the difficulty that press provided. So he turned down Saul's offer once he tried on the armor. Instead, he took into battle the things that he was most comfortable using in his dealings with the lions and bears, as he defined earlier. And so we read of that in chapter 17, verse 40. Then he took his staff in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them into a shepherd's bag in a pouch which he had and his sling was in his hand and he drew near to the Philistine. He's now ready to meet the opponent with what? Just his staff, five stones and his sling. He was anything but intimidating. Goliath was clearly underwhelmed and dismissive of what had finally come out to do battle after these 41 days. So we read in verses 42 through 44, and when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. So the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come with me at sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. So now the combatants are ready to do battle. A battle with an outcome worthy of God and known by each of our children. So let's read of it from verses 45 through 54. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord. Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hand. and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day, I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hastened and ran out toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone. He slung it and struck the Philistine in the forehead, so the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore, David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Now, the men of Israel and Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines as far as the entrance of the valley into the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell along the road to Sharam even as far as Gath and Ekron. Then the children of Israel returned from chasing the Philistines and they plundered their tents. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. After 40 days or 81 challenges, David emerges as the answer to the taunting of David. He first educates Goliath on what it takes to be victorious in battle. And it isn't the physical armaments that Goliath has brought to the fight. It isn't even in David's sling and stones. But instead, 
It is in the fact that David comes in the name of the one true God, whom Goliath has defiled by defiling his army. God will prove that he has won the battle by accomplishing it not with the normal weapons of war, but with a younger, smaller, less experienced man with a weapon intended to protect sheep. God had done the same so many times before, particularly with the taking of the promised land. Like happened with Jericho, David would defeat his opponent in an unorthodox way, behead him, and lead the victory over the Philistines that would result in their dead bodies being food for the birds, leading all the way back to Goliath's hometown of Gath. That wouldn't be because of David's might, nor it didn't happen to establish David's legend, but it was so that everyone would know, without a doubt, that the absolute only God was with Israel. But as you might expect, such brash words coming from a disrespected foe did not discourage Goliath. So he brings the battle to David just to find out that David isn't afraid and also closes the gap between them. It's likely that Goliath takes a stance of battle with his spear ready to run David through when he reaches him. He moves with full confidence based on his physical advantages over David and his previous experiences versus a, a youth with no battle experience. He knows that he has equipment that will protect him from most attacks, and he's trained to use it. He comes certain of the outcome ahead. David now moves to engage by removing the stone from his bag, inserting it into his sling, spinning his sling around, and releasing it to fly to hit Goliath in his forehead. It didn't just hit Goliath and, and bounce off, but instead it sank into his forehead and caused him to fall head first onto the ground. David then finished the jobs by running over to Goliath, removing Goliath's sword from its sheath, killing Goliath, and then beheading him as he had promised to do. That last act made it clear to the Philistines that their champion, their great champion, had not only lost, but was at the hand, dead at the hand of a youth with only a sling and a rock. And just as Goliath had promised if he won, they knew they would give up their lives now to the, the Israelites. Fear was now on the other side, and they fled, yet they could still not avoid the slaughter that followed nor the plunder of their camp. David let Israel have Goliath's head as a trophy to show God's victory, but he kept Goliath's armor for his own. We later know that he didn't keep the weapons, or at least Goliath's sword. But thus ends the story. We know that it is somewhat of a turning point, or at least the start of a turning point in the relationship with Saul and David. We find out that while Saul knows David, he hasn't really seen David for what God has made him. In fact, after the battle, he has to inquire who was David's father, even after he'd requested from him earlier the availability of David to play his harp for him. He makes David part of his inner circle, but then becomes very jealous, as we all know, when the welcoming throngs attribute to David more battle victories than they do to Saul. But all that aside, what lessons can we, now as adults, learn from this story of David and Goliath? What is the learning and what can we profit from its inclusion in scripture, as we read early on, for the purposes of having scripture? I think there are lots of lessons to be learned from the participants in this story. Each reading and studying, at least for me, exposes many more such lessons. So I will make no claim that I'll be sharing every lesson that can be learned from this story. Let's start with the battle loser Goliath. We have a clear example that challenging God, whether directly or by challenging his people, these days his church, doesn't pay. God doesn't need the strongest man, the smartest, the best speaker, the best leader, the best nor the best equipped to win the day. He can use whomever and whatever is willing to be used and whom is committed in their belief in him. We also learn the correlate to that. Might without right will ultimately lose the war. God doesn't promise us immediate victories. He does promise us ultimate success. We may, in fact, lose some battles, but we have been guaranteed that the only victory we truly need, which is to overcome the world and to be rewarded with eternity in heaven, is guaranteed. We read encouraging words like this various places, but we'll turn to 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, where John writes, For whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, 
our faith. Nothing and no one is invincible. Goliath's armor covered the vast majority of his body and his vital organs. He had the strongest metal of the day protecting him, yet his forehead was exposed and became his weak link of which David was able to take advantage. Challenges that we face are often classified as inevitable, undefeatable, invincible by us and others, but everything has a weakness. At the end of the day, the main weakness is their lack of dependence on God. Anything that lacks that can be overcome by someone who has that dependence on God and faces that challenge, not for personal accomplish, but as a way to glorify God by letting him be victorious through us. Ultimately, Goliath was on the wrong side and paid the price for it. So what are some of the lessons we can learn from David through this story? First, we may well face giants in this world. In fact, we will. But if we keep our faith in God, we can defeat them. No, we aren't going to face a, a literal giant like David, nor are we likely to have to have a physical battle with an opponent. But we are going to face figurative giants that seem every bit as intimidating and just as defiling of our faith as Goliath was to David. Nothing we face, no how matter how intimidating it may be, can separate us from God's love unless we allow it to. That's what Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, verses 38 through 39. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing should be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Secondly, David shows us that God has blessed each of us with many and varied talents. We must use each to his glory. David was clearly a good shepherd. Not only did he explain why that qualified him to do battle with Goliath, but it also explains why he was assigned the task over his brothers and why he continued to have that job, even when he had to split time with his playing the harp to calm Saul. He was also a talented musician. We see that in his harp playing, but we will also know later of his skill in writing psalms. It was a skill that God used not just for Saul's benefit, but for the encouragement and education of generations who have read his recorded works. David was also a good communicator. He was able to explain why it was unacceptable to let Goliath say the things he said and why he, though but a mere shepherd boy, was capable of defeating him. We don't always appreciate that we have skills or really value them, but God does. Who would have thought that God could use a harp player to calm a king or a shepherd to defeat a giant? Never question your talents. Just find the opportunity God gives you to use them for his glory. Third, stay humble, but don't make your God humble. David didn't tout himself in any way. He didn't tell anyone about his being anointed by Samuel. His brothers knew, and seemingly that may have caused some jealousy, but he just did whatever was asked of him. He didn't claim he would de fight, defeat Goliath because he was such a great warrior, but because God would use him. He declares God's greatness while displaying his own humility. He wanted God's people and God's adversaries to acknowledge God's greatness. He acknowledges such in various psalms, but we'll look at Psalm chapter 60 or Psalm 68, verse 35. Oh God, you are more awesome than your holy places. The God of Israel is he who gives strength and power to his people. Blessed be God. Fourth, don't just assume how God will bring victory or what the extent of the challenge may be. Be prepared. I want you to think back in the story and consider what David took into battle with him. He had his staff, which he didn't end up using. He had his sling and he had five stones. Now, have you ever considered why David had five stones? He was only facing one man. Did he doubt that God would overcome with just one stone? Was he prepared that it might take more? Or was he aware of the fact that Goliath had four brothers that might be lurking and might take action? We don't really know what was David's thought pattern here, but I think it's safe to say that David went and prepared for whatever might happen and whatever God might require of him. We need to have complete faith in God's ability to produce a victory 
but we don't need to decide how he's going to accomplish it and limit our preparation. God could have just struck Goliath down without David, but David took in the weapons he was comfortable with and extra ammunition to support whatever God's plan called for. And we need to be ready to do the same. Finally, when facing a challenge, it isn't in our skills or our possessions where we'll find victory. Oh, they'll be useful, but it is always in facing them with God. We are all guilty of looking at situations and judging the potential outcomes merely by taking into account what we have in our possession to deal with those situations. Now, if you had been just a non-biased observer of this battlefield, there is no doubt as you consider the fair physical characteristics of the two combatants, as you looked at their weapons and their defense, if you looked at their experience in doing battle, you would have clearly come to the conclusion that it would be no contest. All the factors fell not just slightly in Goliath's favor, but heavily or overwhelmingly. Yet it wasn't about any of those visible factors. It was about the invisible God and the faith that David had in his God. And the same is true of us as we read in John 1, 4, 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Is there anything we can learn from Saul? Of course. We can start by looking at a positive. If you feel that you can't do what God needs done, then find someone who can. Support them. But ultimately, get out of their way. Some of us might find ourselves faced with opportunities to teach others the gospel, but we may feel inadequate for the job. Now, I could go back to one of our previous lessons and say that you let God do the teaching through you, but the truth is we don't all have the same talents. You might be able to draw others to desire to learn about this God you worship, but turn around and feel that you lack the talents to actually do that teaching. If so, find someone who has that talent. Offer them support but let them do the job the way that they know best, not how you think it might need to be done. On the negative side, Saul showed the impact of his leadership in that he had an army that was dismayed and fearful as they saw that experienced and exposed and exemplified in their leader. Time and time again throughout the Bible, we see examples where leaders that were confident in themselves, in God and in the outcome, were able to motivate those around them. And like with Saul, we also see time and time again where weak or doubting leaders find followers that are also weak and doubting, and they result in failure. If you are going to lead, and all of us in one way or another impact or lead others, then do it with strong confidence in God, in his ability to equip you to be successful and achieving ultimate success. We are guaranteed the final victory. I hope you've gained some more appreciation for this children's story through our study today. It is important to take it to heart that God can help you overcome any challenge, no matter the size, and that all of us have challenges. Don't let anyone say you can't. You can when God's on your side. You can be David and slay your Goliath. Today, you may be facing challenges to your faith, and you may need to turn to others to help you overcome those challenges. I know your brothers and sisters in this congregation would welcome the opportunity to apply their talents to help you overcome and to encourage you as you do battle. If your challenge is that you haven't put on the armor of Christ by becoming a Christian, then I, I challenge you to, to talk with your elders and get that addressed so that you're ready for the battles that you will face. Whatever your situation, take David's lead and give it to God to guarantee your victory. That, let's sing together.